Hi, I'm Malika Bilad, filling in for Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, kidnapped, smuggled across borders, and sold into forced labor. This is the reality for millions of children around the world. We speak with a survivor. Filling in for me as digital producer is our very own Omar Vidar. Omar, I know this is something that affects so many people around the world. It does, and it's not just something that you have to be an investigator to see. I mean, it's essentially something forced child labor and child labor in general is something that our community is seeing all the time. If you take a look at my screen here, Ghulam from Pakistan says, yes, from department stores to an auto mechanic shop, majority of parents forcefully involve their kids in this. We have Yaya here from Nigeria who says, yes, it is all over the place here. It seems like a traditional thing and it's deeply rooted. Then we have this tweet from the U.S. also. One day one tweet says that during his visit to West Africa in Benin, he says plenty of children are working on site construction for private homes. Of course, we want to know why this is happening and what can be done to stop it. So we want to hear from our community online. Be sure to tweet in using the hashtag AJStream and we'll get to your feedback. Without any hope of returning home, more than 5 million children around the world have been trafficked into forced labor. That's according to the International Labor Organization. In conflict zones, children are especially at risk of being sold to armed groups, often to participate in military conflict. In some instances, the child is peddled by their own family for money or to pay off a debt, as most of the victims come from poor or marginalized communities. Often the children end up in sweatshops, working for little or no pay, making many of the products we use daily. With July 30th marking the first ever day of trafficking in persons, what can put an end to the forced labor of children? Joining us to discuss this via Skype from Olympia, Washington is Ronnie Hong, a survivor of child trafficking and one of the world's leading voices in the fight against modern day slavery. I'd like to start on my computer with a definition. This is from the International Labor Organization of Forced Labor. It refers to situations in which persons are coerced to work through the use of violence or intimidation, or by more subtle means, such as accumulated debt, retention of identity papers, or threats of denunciation to immigration authorities. Well, Ronnie, it's one thing to see a definition on the screen. It's another thing entirely to have it happen to you. Can you take us back, if you will, to the seven-year-old version of yourself? How did it feel to be taken from your home in Kerala, India? You know, I was, uh, yes, born in southern part of India, and at the age of seven is when a friend of uh, the family said, hey, I can help this one child, give her a better education, give her food, and everything seemed to be just perfect. But in reality, so I went to this one location, and in reality, this woman who was running this shelter-like was uh, in the business of selling children. She then so, as a seven-year-old child, I was crying for my mom, uh, but what happened is she sold me into slavery across the state border to where I did not know anybody, I didn't know the language, I was disoriented, and everything was unfamiliar to me. So as a seven, can you imagine? We're, we, many of us in the audience have seven-year-old little girls and we need to do everything we can to protect them. So in my case, I became, so they, my broker put me as destitute and dying because of the beatings and torture and the abuse that he did. So what he did uh, for final is that he sold me for international adoption into Canada, Canada into the United States. We're talking about an illegal business, selling people for a profit. And Rana, you mentioned uh, the time when you left. You said your broker. Uh, you said so matter of fact, but I want to show a picture of how old you were at that time. This is the eight-year-old version of you. You can see the scabs, the marks on your legs, on your skin. Uh, how did it feel? Can, can you remember the thoughts that ran through your head uh, as an eight-year-old? You know, as an eight-year-old little girl, I could not understand what was happening. I mean, I was taught to trust adults, uh, to obey adults. Did you trust the woman who came to your house in the I, first place? I did, because this is what happens in the trafficking industry. Somebody comes up and acts like they are the answer to the world. They pretend to have everything that you need in your time of vulnerability. And so in my case, I absolutely trusted this woman. In fact, she gave me candy. So what eight-year-old child would not... Um, 
trust somebody in the neighborhood who was being kind to her. <coughs> but what we know today, this is a tactic that traffickers and recruiters use every single day. And in my case, this woman was the recruiter who was actually getting the ownership of the child so she can sell that child. And basically, she ruined my life. Rani, just to follow up on that, essentially to give the audience a better sense of what actually, you know, how this interaction happens between these traffickers and the parents, Kenneth here asks online, says, what promises or rewards did the traffickers say to convince your parents to essentially give you up? Can you tell us a little bit more about how that process goes down? Okay, absolutely. This is, so we're talking about vulnerability. So in my case, this woman just promised and said, I will do everything um, in my power to help your family. Uh, let me help one of your children. So she gave false um, promises of said, you know, from food. They didn't feed me. You can tell by that picture. Starvation is a major part of this trafficking industry. She, this woman, promised me that I would have the best life, and that was a false statement, and that is a taking advantage of someone um, in their vulnerability because people watching this are going to want to know what they can do. I just want to give our, our viewers uh, an idea of the scope of this. So on my <coughs> laptop, I pulled up, this is a map, this is productsofslavery.org, um, and, and this was done in conjunction uh, with your organization, uh, Aiden. Mm -hmm. uh, this shows um, the products that are made using child labor or forced labor. I'm hovering here, this is India. 18 different products come out of India. They range from locks, leather goods, uh, gems, garments. This is something that affects so many of us, Ronnie. Even the clothes that I'm wearing today, many of them cotton, picked by young hands that probably shouldn't be out in the fields picking them. I know that I'm complicit in it, but what do I do? Yeah, you know, and this is a question because a lot of times we, much of the public believe, oh, slavery doesn't affect my life. Well, that's a misconception because we know we can see forced labor in the products that we use every day. We know that forced labor in the supply chain, um, that, are in, that children were being used in that labor to make that. The most commonly are the gold, the cotton, and coffee. These products are often produced far from where they are bought, we think, oh, it, it doesn't affect us. But its supply chain is very complex, right? We all agree on that, changing hands along the way. But the raw material that our products are made from are, have touched, have been touched by slaves. And that may shock some of us. And I think this is something we need to wake up to as a country and as a world, that every single day we are using products in our houses, in our offices, in our hands on t with technology that may have been tainted by former slaves. So today, I want to bring an answer to that. Uh, what can we do? And that is why I'm asking the audience, you know, to let's act, let's get educated on this issue, but then let's start buying responsibly. Be re buy things from companies that are being responsible and that are being ethically sourced so we are assured that if that company who makes our clothing, the shoes that I wear, the shoes you, everyone on this floor, it is that it is not being tainted by slavery. I want companies, it's, it's I want these major corporations to take a stand and make a commitment to myself and to the millions of victims who have been in forced labor. I want companies to make a commitment to work with me to ending this trade. Yes, we need countries and country leaders to do something about uh, this work. So in October of this last year, I went before the UN General Assembly and I brought this to their attention and I said I needed these countries to, to implement the law that prevent, you know, to prevent forced labor. But when I went before the UN, I absolutely said it needs to be part of the post-2015 uh, agenda, right? They, at this point, they're looking at what can they do to um, put this in their agenda and I asked them this is a must. And so I also offered them my three-point plan to eradicating slavery. And one of that way is by my uh, freedom seal. We, uh, the Trani Foundation, uh, wanted to give something to companies and so they can earn, I mean, so they got to apply for our seal and say and commit to us ending slavery. 
So Ronnie, as you're speaking, I pulled up the seal here. Do you think that this will work? This is basically uh, uh, the same thing you would do for a diamond to show that it is not a blood diamond, so to speak. Are companies signing on to this? Absolutely. Companies are interested because they know this is the next. they got to create the next generation of buyers. And today, our millennial generation is going to demand that these companies take a social responsibility, be socially conscious in their products, and the way the products are made in their supply chain. So I believe this is going to be one of the fundamental uh, pr you know, principles mm -hmm. that are really going to change the way we look at forced labor. It is difficult, and that's where we're going to have to pick up in the post show because that's all the time we have for the main show. Welcome to the Streams Online Post Show. We're continuing our discussion on children trafficked into forced labor. Still with us, Ronnie Hong, a survivor of child trafficking. Omar, the community has lots to say about this, I know. They're actually talking about the rehabilitation angle of all this. We have Rachel here who tweeted in to Ronnie asking her, in terms of agency, did you feel that aid agencies treated you more as a victim or a survivor? So she's kind of asking about the empowerment aspect of it. We also have a video comment here from India. Take a listen to this. The rescue of child labor is meaningless without comprehensive rehabilitation. Rehabilitation of re children rescued should be educational, psychosocial, medical, and it must end in reintegration into mainstream uh, society. So, Rani, can you talk a little bit about the importance of rehabilitation for children who have undergone forced labor? Absolutely. You know, I think this is one of the top priorities we should have. Because as a former victim, I was so traumatized, so beaten to the point that I looked destitute and dying. I mean, this is gonna. So I needed to, uh, you know, people to work with me to rehabilitate me, to bring me back to like life. I stopped talking for a, uh, for a while. I stopped walking. I just simply couldn't function because of the abuse by somebody else who exploited me. So as today. The Trani Foundation, we have empowerment programs. We realize there is a huge need to rehabilitate former victims as myself and as my, and my husband. So today we ask for, um, we have programs for education. We also have programs for um, the arts. For a while, I wasn't really functional, but I did know how to play sports. And I really believe sports is a healing process. For in my story, I wasn't talking much, but what I did know is that I could kick a ball. And that simple kicking a ball, rehabilitation through sports and the arts was a, um, the thing that I believe that built my confidence, saying I am a worth being, human being. I have value and I have something to contribute. And that playing sports helped build my confidence to live life again and to come back and get reintegrated back into society. So absolutely, I ask for every viewers and every listeners um, to work on rescuing and restoring the former victims. Such and as mine. Ronnie, yeah. in our, our last minute of our program here, before we get the closing thoughts from the community, July 30th, you'll be in Colombia. What will you be doing? Absolutely. So I want. Um, so July 30th is our very first World Day Against Trafficking in Person. I went before the UN General Assembly to ask for this day, and in, uh, later in the year, they, uh, December, they passed a resolution to uh, create awareness on this event, but uh, on this day, but also take action. I will be traveling to the Columbia, working with the Ministry of Interior, uh, UNODC, different organizations, saying um, we as survivors were important, just like your m daughters, um, your children, and I will be going there. Uh, with a conference, uh, of one of our first international conference of survivors. These are survivors who are standing up and saying, we are leaders. We're more than our stories. We're part of the solution. Ronnie, and is I, there a hashtag that our community can follow to follow along what you're doing on July 30th? Absolutely. Please follow um, I, I Give Hope campaign. So that's hashtag I Give Hope. Uh, it's a campaign, a global campaign that I am running uh, in partnership and collaboration with UNODC. We'll so tweet please that follow out. us and uh, everybody start tweeting um, and raising awareness on this issue because this is important to not to only myself, but I speak for those without a voice. And today there are millions of children like the little girl I was uh, that was isolated, beaten, and starved. 
And so today we have that opportunity to change that system around for the little girl I was. So please, carry my voice, join the hashtag, and help raise the visibility of this issue, especially on July 30th of 2014. Ending thoughts from the community, Omar. We have Kristen on Facebook who's just expressing her general frustration with the issue of forced child labor. She says, How greedy must any company or person be to do this to a child? There is no excuse for this, none. I am sick of everything boiling down to money. But on a more upbeat note, we have Michelle here who actually tweeted into Ronnie saying, I don't have a question, but thanks for giving a voice to all the victims. God bless you. You are an angel. We'll be looking for those streets on July 30th, as you can as well on home now. Just enough time to tell you what's going to happen on Thursday's show. Any given day, more than 15,000 informants are collecting information for the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation. We'll be discussing a new Al Jazeera documentary about the world of FBI informants and counterterrorism operations. Until then, we'll see you online.